Good morning, Bethel. We want to ask if you guys can stand with us in this time of worship. Come on, church, we sing. He shames every idol. He reigns without right. Jehovah Nisi, fight your battles. Jehovah Nisi, fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh, meet your need. Jehovah Rapha, heal your body. Jehovah Shalom, be your peace. Jehovah Nisi, fight your battles. Jehovah Jireh, meet your need. Jehovah Jireh, meet your need. 
Good morning, church. We want to welcome you to Bethel Full Gospel. Man, it is, gr- it is great to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. You know, what we just sang was, you know, the, the many names of God, right? And it says we, get to, we call on him, right? And I said last service, you know, it's such a privilege and an honor to call on him. You know, he, he gives us that opportunity to call on him, and he hears us. But not only does he hear us, he, he listens to us, right? You know, it's one thing to for someone to hear you, but for someone to listen to you and, and meet your needs, right? So with every, with every eye closed, Father, thank you. thank you, Father, because you listen to us, Lord. Thank you because you provide. Father, you're our banner in battle. Lord, you heal, and, and you're the God of peace. Thank you. So, Father, we pray that you would just continue to have your way in this place, Lord. We worship you in your mighty name. Amen. I'm always sing. I'm gonna sing till my heart starts changing. Oh, I'm gonna worship till I mean every word. Cause the way I feel And the fear I'm facing Doesn't change who you are Or what you deserve I give you my worship You still deserve it You're worthy You're worthy You're worthy of my song I'll pour out your praises and blessing and breaking. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy of my song. Oh, you're worthy, you're worthy, worthy of my song. Come on, church, lift us up. I'm gonna live. Like my king is risen Gonna preach to my soul That you've already won And even though I can't see it I'm gonna keep believing That every promise you Say yes or no or wait, you are worthy. Yes, Lord Jesus. Through it all I choose to say, you are worthy. I'll never stop singing your praise. I'll never stop singing your praise. And in the blessing and the pain, you are worthy. Whether you say
And when you wipe these tears away, I'll cry worthy. Come on, above, above every other name, you are worthy. I'll never stop singing your praise. I'll never stop singing your praise. I'll never stop singing your praise. church wherever you are lift up his name oh you're worthy you're worthy come on worship him this morning you got a reason to praise come on every voice and when I finally see your face I'll cry worthy And when you wipe these tears away I'll cry worthy Above every other name You are worthy I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise. Come on, church, help me sing. Blessed assurance, yes, yes. Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit. I'm washed in his blood And what he did for me on Calvary Is more than enough I trust in God My Savior, the one Who will never fail I trust in God my Savior the one who will never fail he will never fail perfect submission at rest I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps so this is my story and this is my song I'm praising my risen King and Savior
Come on, I need you to sing this loud over your life. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. Come on, from your heart. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard. church sing this out you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great It's your breath and our love, sing. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath and our love. So we pour out our praise to you only. Come 
on, you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Come on, from your heart. church with one voice lift this up and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great hard to say great are you Lord some of you might be in a season where where you don't understand in a storm whatever you may feel but as you sing great are you Lord the faith inside you begins to build because what you're what you're saying is what you're hearing and when you put your faith in him you put your trust in him and watch him do the work watch him bring him bring you out so with one voice, we're gonna sing that again. Come on, help me sing. Oh, sing great. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Come on, he's greater than your circumstance. Church, we 
sand So I throw up my heads And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much I've got nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah. Come on, sing it again. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Come on, lift it up. One more time. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know it's not much. Got nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah Hallelujah Come on church, give him praise this morning Oh, we thank you, Lord the Lord is great. The Lord is in this place. Father, we put our trust in you this morning. Father, you're great. Lord, you're greater than anything we face. Lord God, we're, you're greater than anything that we, we might be going through, Father, which is why we give you the worship and the praise, Lord God, which is why we put our faith in you, God. Lord, you fight our battles, God. You, you're the healer. You're the provider. You're the God of peace. And Father, as, as we continue this service, Lord God, let's remember that. Give us, give us the strength to remember that. That you are God and no one can stand against you. Lord, you're great. We love you and we worship you. In your mighty name, amen. Church, you may be seated. Hi, welcome to Bethel Full Gospel. We're so glad that you joined us today. When you came in, you should have received a bulletin, and on that bulletin is a connection card at the bottom. Please fill it out with as much or as little information as you're comfortable filling out and put it in the collection bucket in the back. Alternatively, there is a QR code on the seat back in front of you. Please scan that and connect with us digitally. If you're with us for the very first time, there's a welcome bag on the welcome desk in the foyer. Please pick one up on your way out. There's a special gift in there for you. Thank you so much for attending Bethel Full Gospel today. Hey church, Pastor Steve here, and I wanna take this opportunity to invite you out to our starting point classes. Our starting point classes are really geared for those who are newer to the church or those who are looking to get more involved and even for those who are looking into official church membership. There's four different classes, and we run these classes on the last Sunday night of every month. So whether you're looking to find out more about what we believe or you're looking for a place to serve, Starting Point is the place for you. So come on out and join us last Sunday of the month for our Starting Point classes. 
We'd like to invite you out to our upcoming night of worship. It will take place on October 2nd, a Wednesday night in place of our regular Bible study. Come expecting for the Lord to move. Can't wait to see you there. We want to invite you to our meet and greet dinner on October 6th at 5.30 p.m. at our Bethel Fellowship Hall. Come on out for a great meal and a great time of fellowship. Please sign up on the Church Center app. We hope to see you there. There are four ways to give here at Bethel Full Gospel. One, you can go to our website at BethelFullGospel.com. Two, you can go to the Church Center app. Three, you can mail a check to 3669 Gilderland Avenue. Or four, you can put it in the buckets at the back of the sanctuary. Thank you so much and God bless. Just want to reiterate that starting point class tonight at, at where is David? At six. What time is starting point? Somebody help me. Six p.m. Thank you. Because the meet and greets five thirty, and that's the following week. Um, Starting point class, see a lot of new faces. We'd love to have you come on out and join us. Uh, also, the following week is the meet and greet. Um, another great opportunity to connect with some people. Listen, if you're tired of coming in the church, busy, crazy, leave church, don't talk to anybody, come tonight for the connect class or come next week to the meet and greet and get to sit down and talk with some people, pastor, staff, the whole thing. It'd be great to connect with you. I see a bunch of new faces and some old face, some more experienced faces. <laughs> We'd love to see all of you coming out and join us. So let's go ahead and we will jump into the word of God this morning. We're continuing our series today on 40 days, navigating life storms. We're actually gonna be wrapping up our series today. Uh, we did it for two weeks. We took a break with uh, David Nelms last week, but we're going to go ahead and finish it up this morning. 40 days in scripture. There's a lot of references to this 40 day concept. And in each of them, uh, there, there were some significant trials and things happening. And then there was some transformation that worked through the process. Uh, we've talked about some of these. We talked about Moses on Mount Sinai, was there for 40 days before he received the Ten Commandments. I mentioned to you about Elijah after his victory at Mount Carmel uh, on the run for his life from uh, Queen Jezebel and King Ahab and 40 days he was, he was running for his life and met with God. Jesus and his temptation in the wilderness that we read about in the Gospels, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. There's a sermon there. Uh, the Holy Spirit led him for 40 days and 40 nights. And there Jesus was being prepared. This was before he kind of launched into his full public ministry. After his death and resurrection, for a period of 40 days, Jesus appears to not only the apostles, but also Corinthians tells us to 500 other people. And before he goes and ascends into heaven. So this 40 days kind of keeps repeating itself. And with each time, we notice this, this process. And this is the process that, that we're praying for in the end. There's tribulation, there's storms, there's battles. We get that. Then there's a preparation that takes place during those 40 days. And then at the end, in each of the instances I mentioned, there was a transformation. There was something new. And I say this should be our prayer because in this world, we will have tribulation. Jesus tells us, this is our verse for the series. Jesus promised in, in John 16, 33, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, be of good courage, I have overcome the world. So we know storms and trials and challenges are coming. We're not exempt from those. But in that, the prayer is that through the adversity, God would work on us and that we would come out of it better than we went in. That, that's the transformation part. We go from tribulation to preparation to transformation. And your prayer should be, 
If you're here this morning and you're in the middle of some kind of storm in your life, and, and most people are, there's always something going on, your prayer should be, God, whatever the lesson is, whatever you're teaching me, whatever you want to be, be glorified in in my life, whatever I'm supposed to be doing, help me to learn the lesson. Help me to learn. How many of you hated repeating classes in high school? Let's see who raised their hand because then we find out who had to repeat classes, <laughs> okay? Yeah, like nobody, wa nobody wants to retake the test. You, you submit a paper, you get a terrible grade, teacher's like, but I'll let you redo it. You're like, oh, I didn't want to do it the first time, right? No one wants to retake a test. If God is, is working something in your life, and many times in life, most of the time, God does his best work in trials and hardships. You don't have to like it, but that's, that's the fact. And as God is working that in us, for his glory, for that transformation, we, we don't want to repeat that. So our prayer becomes, God, what are you teaching me? What are you showing me? How, how can I be more like Jesus through my trial? Tribulation, preparation, transformation. Our main text for the series has been in the book of Genesis, probably the most well-known reference to 40 days. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the great flood and Noah's ark. And in this account, we see all three parts at work. We got the storm, the tribulation, we got preparation. And then at the end, we got some transformation. Uh, our series verse, John 16, 33, Jesus told his disciples, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So because we took a week off and because we're wrapping the series up today, let me quick review, before the test, quick review of, of parts one and two. So we started talking about the storm on the outside, the storm all around us. For Noah, it was rain and it was the, the, the depths opening up and gushing water and, and it was a physical storm, but we have other storms in our life that, that are more than just rain and floods. And we talked about the storms in our nation, uh, how bad things have become in the economy, gas prices, food prices, housing prices, interest rates. We talked about division in our world today. We talked about the sin of hate and racism. We talked about greed and, and ungodly pursuits. We talked about the moral decline in America. It ain't getting better, church. But we're not getting closer and closer to Jesus. It's getting worse out there. And we talked about that moral decline a little bit. And it's not just in our country. We talked about in the world. Talked about the wars and rumors of wars to, to steal a line from Scripture. And we're living in that reality today. Talking about starvation, disease, poverty, natural disasters, fear. And both in our country and in the world, people abandoning their faith, turning their backs on God. There is certainly a storm all around us. And I gave you a couple things to remember. Three quick points on week one. Number one, Christians are not exempt from the storms of this life. Now listen, you will save yourself some heartache by following God's word. There are things you can't avoid. Young people, listen to me. There are storms you can avoid by, by following the word of God. However, it doesn't make us completely exempt. There, there will still be storms in this world. Secondly, the presence of the storm does not indicate the absence of God. We know that in storms, God does some of his finest work. And that's our third point, that God will use these storms in our life to accomplish his purposes. And we started with the storm on the outside. Then on week two, we went to the storm on the inside. When the storm comes home. It's not just, oh, the world's so terrible. Now things become personal. And we know Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, the eight of them were on the boat together, <laughs> locked in, just eight of them, bunch of animals, lots of work to do. And the storm was 40 days and 40 nights, but they were in the boat. Scripture tells us 371 days. Eight of them, just family. <laughs> Didn't go outside for air, just in the boat. 
So we talked about some of the more personal storms that impact us and storms on the home front, storms that impact our families. We talked about the attacks against marriage, talked about divorce and single parent homes. We talked about abuse, addictions, fear, stress, financial stress, jobs, planning. We talked about selfishness, unforgiveness, all things that hit very close to home. How do we keep our family safe during the storm? We talked about preparation, spiritual preparation, laying the proper foundation. We talked about moving to a safe spot. We talked about a friend who was caught in a tornado and, and he, he took his family to the innermost room and that's where they kind of huddled together as this thing passed by. Sometimes in the middle of a storm, you gotta move, you gotta do something. You, you gotta take your family and you gotta make a change or you gotta shift directions. And it might not be a physical move, it might be spiritual or emotional or, or, or abandoning a bad, ungodly philosophy. You have to make a shift. You have to move and God will respond to that. We talked about doing the work, that storms don't ever ask if it's convenient. Do they? You ever get like just a, a message, I don't know, from an angel? They're like, hey, we're prepping you for a storm. I, how's the third week in October for you? Oh, that's not good. I got a lot going on. Can we do the, the spring? Storms don't do that. They just show up. And our temptation is we want life to stop so I can deal with this storm, but life doesn't stop. And all the stresses you had before the storm, you still have, and now you have a storm. There's still work to do. There's still ground to gain and, and things to get accomplished. We talked about doing the work, and lastly, when we've done everything we can do, we stand. When we've done everything we could, we endure. And we just trust God even through the most difficult times. So we've talked about the storm around us. We talked about the storm inside us. This morning... I want to talk to you about the God of the storm, the God of the storm. So we have Noah's Ark. It's in there. It's raining. Noah and his family are going through the whole thing. And there's a couple things we need to remember. The timing of this storm, when it started and when it stopped, is completely in the hands of God. It did not rain a moment before God said, let it rain. And it didn't rain a second longer than God said, let it end. He is the God of the storm. The severity of the storm, the intensity of what they were going through, God had it perfectly under control. So we need to remember this during storms in our life. First, that God's in control every day. Any control freaks in here? You don't have to raise your hand. I know that's, that's a lot to think about. I'm in recovery. I'm in a 12 step. Uh, yeah. I'm in a 12 step program to to get out of that mode. And we want to have everything under control and we don't. And these storms don't really care about your control. But how inspiring it is to our faith to remember no matter what we are facing, God is in control. I need to remind some of you of this this morning because you were caught off guard. God was not. You were surprised. God was not. It's no longer in your control, but it's still in his, amen? It's still in his. God is still in control even when we're not. God is still calling the shots. Nothing has happened in this world apart from the sovereignty of God. And the sovereignty of God is just our reminder that he is on the throne and he rules and reigns and he's in control even when you're not. So relax. Our God is still in control. Never surprised, never unaware, never shocked. So there's a perfect passage in the New Testament that really illustrates for us uh, the God of the storm. And it's, again, a very physical storm, and it's Jesus and his disciples. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Mark. If you don't have it, we'll have it on the screen here. And we're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. And I'm going to read for you through verse 35 to 41. And this is in the New King James. So let's go ahead and let's look at what the Scripture tells us, starting in verse 35. 
It reads, on the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took Jesus along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. You know, Jesus had just completed a long day of ministry. If you read previously in Mark, it tells us he was, he was preaching and teaching and working with people. He, he had healed people. He had cast out some demons, and that's what Jesus did, and he, and he preached the kingdom. And after he had finished a long day of work, he tells his disciples, all right, let's jump in the boat. We'll head over to our next stop. And here's these storms again, not at all interested in the fact that you just had a busy day. Here it's going to come. And as these men go out on the boat, the New King James says a great windstorm arose on the lake or on the Sea of Galilee. Matthew 24 says a great tempest arose on the sea. A furious squall is another, is another translation. A huge storm hits them. And there's a couple things about this that are really interesting. The first one is this. Up to this point, they've done everything exactly the way Jesus said to. I think this is significant. They worked with him all day as he ministered and preached and taught and ministered to the people. They were with him. They were helping. They were doing whatever he said. Then at his command... They get into the boat and they go where he tells them to go. They did everything that Jesus told them to do and they still found themselves in the middle of a storm. Are you listening this morning, church? Because there's some thoughts out there that when we're in a storm, it's, it's our fault. And sometimes it is. We, we cause enough of our own problems, right? We, we don't have to pretend we never do that. Well, sometimes we, we've made the bed, now we got to lie in it. Sometimes we're paying consequences for bad choices we made. We've all done that. But here, they did everything right. See, there was this belief in Bible times that if something bad was happening to you, it had to be because of sin. There's a story in the Gospel of John where a man born blind is brought to Jesus and the Pharisees say, who sinned, you or your parents, that you were born blind? And I read that and I'm like, is it me or my mother-in-law, <laughs> right? <laughs> Probably her. Uh, so th this, I, oh, speaking of mothers, speaking of mothers, today is my mother's birthday, Rosalie. Uh, so happy birthday, mom. I don't know if she watched first service or second, but I'm not taking chances. I missed last year. I was on the golf course. <laughs> So I've made up for that, we're even. Uh, so this idea of if, if something bad's happening, it must be because of my sin. And scripture makes it clear, though that happens, it's not always the case. And here we see the disciples did exactly what Jesus said. And now they're in trouble. And here's the interesting thing with these disciples. Half of them, roughly, before Jesus called them, all had the same job. What did they do? They're fishermen. This is the Sea of Galilee. The sea is about 13 miles long at its longest point and about eight miles across. And they're going across the sea. That's not huge. That's not the ocean, okay? That's not the Great Lakes, these experience, if I did my homework, I would pick a local lake as a comparison, but I didn't, so you'll just have to imagine it with me. These experienced fishermen, who I don't think it's an exaggeration to say, spent most of their life on the sea. They knew when it was safe to travel and when it wasn't. They were prepared. They were educated. Their fathers were fishermen before them. Their father's father was probably also a fisherman. They, they knew this. And when Jesus said, get in the boat, just second nature, they looked out and they're like, okay, yeah, it looks good. We're, we can make it. Storms are not uncommon. They knew that. 
but they looked and everything was clear. They did everything that Jesus told them to do. They even used their own wisdom and experience to say, okay, this is good. This is a good direction. So they had faith. They had wisdom. They were working all of it together. And as soon as they got on the boat, scripture says a great storm arose. It's interesting, this specific storm, uh, several commentators have noted it wasn't a natural occurrence. It was a supernatural occurrence. From the time of Genesis 3, when God tells the serpent, your seed and the seed of the woman will, will be at war with one another. Satan has been trying to kill the, the, the seed of the woman, which ultimately would be Jesus, but even before then, to destroy the Jews. All throughout scripture, there's this theme. And several commentators point to the fact that this is another spot where Satan tries to kill Jesus before the cross, before Jesus becomes our sacrifice. So this storm wasn't even a normal storm. It was something supernatural. And this is a reminder for you you could do everything correctly. You could be going to church. You could be in your word. You could be treating your, your husband or your wife well. You could be nice to your kids. You could be respectful. You could be doing everything the way you're supposed to. And you're serving and you're giving and you're worshiping and you're listening to God and you can still find yourself in the middle of a storm. It happened to the disciples, and it happens in our life as well. In this world, we will have tribulation. So this storm pops up, and verse 38 tells us this. But Jesus was in the stern of the boat. What is that, the front or the back? Stern is what? You don't know either. <laughs> okay, good. Super helpful. Way to be nautical, people. <laughs> Jesus was in, it's a stern in the aft, which is the front. Someone's got to know this. The bow's the front. What's the aft? What's the stern? Stern's the rear? You're just guessing, so you be quiet. Anyway, so Jesus is sleeping on the boat. And this is great because we have two things going on here. We have the disciples scared for their life and we have Jesus sleeping. You cannot have two more diametrically opposed reactions to what is happening. The disciples are losing their mind, okay? They are in full-blown panic, water's coming into the boat. Oh my gosh, they run to Jesus. He, know, did Jesus snore? I don't, snoring's not a sin. He could have snored. We don't know. <laughs> Jesus is just cutting Z's, just laying there. And the disciples are, are freaked out. Was Jesus ignoring them? No. Was it that Jesus didn't care? Again, no. What it tells us is in this moment, Jesus wasn't worried. This is good. Because they were super worried. They were all kinds of worked up and stressed out and fear and panic and anxiety. And Jesus was at peace enough to sleep. How many of you have learned you can't sleep when you're all worked up, right? You go to bed and, you know, you keep your eyes closed because you know you're supposed to do that. It's supposed to help you sleep. But your mind is flying and you're like rolling through the whole situation. You're, you're working out all the solutions. You're having full-blown conversations about a situation didn't happen yet. Like, it probably won't, but you've already solved it. And you look over and it's 3.15. You see the clock. Oh, my goodness. Well, you don't sleep when you're panicked. You don't sleep when the anxiety is hitting you and the stress and everything else. And Jesus was sleeping. And it reminds us he wasn't anxious about this. He, he knew who he was. He knew there was no need to panic, and he didn't. 
And as Jesus was there, unworried, the disciples asked this question. And it's, it's great because they, they say the quiet part out loud. They go to Jesus, and here's the quote, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? This is the extent of their fear. They go to Jesus and they say, don't you care we're dying here? Wow. We are church folk and we are way too refined to say that. But we think it. In the middle of our trial, in the middle of the storm, our prayers end up something like, God, what are you doing? God, don't you see what's happening here? And maybe even we begin to question, God, do you even care? God, this is all going on. You are powerful. You can stop this. You don't. Do you even care about my life? Do you even care about my storm? The disciples say the quiet part out loud. Jesus, don't you care we're dying here? When we know that Jesus cared. So the question is, why didn't Jesus do anything? Well, why didn't he do anything sooner? Why didn't he do anything before they, they got to this point? And I think there's an answer to this. Jesus was waiting for them to come to him. There's a big storm going on. It was more than they could handle. It was well beyond their control. And Jesus peacefully was waiting for them to come to him. And not only was he waiting for them to come, but how they came to him would be an important part as well. Verse 39, then Jesus arose and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Peace be still. The Bible uses this, this term peace, it's mentioned sometimes holding your peace, which means zip it, right? Hold your peace, like just relax, zip it, don't say anything. I think if we were to translate this into today's terminology, it's not a stretch. Jesus uses this phrase when a demon was, he was casting a demon out and the demon was speaking to him and he told the, the demon, zip it. Same, same phrase here. Jesus gets up in the boat, the stern of the boat, and we all know what that is. <laughs> and he says to the wind and the waves and the storm, shut up. That is super cool. Yeah. However, the next part's even more amazing. Immediately, imme not like after 20 minutes, immediately the wind stopped and scripture says there was a great calm. Jesus got up and he said, peace, be still, be quiet, zip it, stop. And immediately he did it. And we're reminded here how easy it is for Jesus to do something no one else could do. How simple it was for him to remedy this situation that no man could have possibly fixed up. Jesus with just a word. We read in the beginning of Genesis how God created the heavens and the earth. And it says that in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. He spoke and there was light. In Revelation 19, talks about Jesus returning, the angels and the saints, battle of Armageddon. I use the term battle loosely. It is very one-sided, okay? And the Bible says Jesus comes with a sword proceeding out of his mouth. He's just gonna speak victory. He's not gonna like, put up your duke, Satan. <laughs> Jesus rides in on the white horse and he says, it's over. Amen. And victory. Just like that. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So at the beginning, Jesus just spoke it and it was. And in the storm, Jesus just spoke it and it stopped. And in the end, he'll return and he'll just speak it. 
We're reminded of the power of our God. Just a word, just a word from God and everything changes. Everything changes. Verse 40, and Jesus says to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And Jesus sets up a paradigm for us where the opposite of faith isn't no faith. The opposite of faith was fear. Because another word for faith is trust. So you either trust God or you don't. And if you don't, you're afraid. And this is the question that Jesus has for his followers. How can you be afraid when I'm right here with you? How can you be fearful when, when you know I'm right here? I can do anything. And this is the response because in every trial and every storm of our life, we can go to Jesus, amen? But how we go to Jesus is important. Do we go in fear? Do we go in panic? James tells us that he who doubts is like a, a, a wave of the sea tossed back and forth, double-minded and unstable, tossed back and forth. Sometimes we sit around here and we, we worship God. God, you're the greatest. God, you're the best. God, you can do anything. Then we have some hardship in our life and we're like, oh, God. <laughs> and I go to that verse, double-minded double and unstable. And, and we feel that way sometimes. Is he God of everything? Is he the one who spoke the world into existence? Does he hold the entire world in his hand? Is he upholding us every single day by his strength? Or do I need to worry? Or do I need to be afraid? Like, is there something going on where God's like, oh, Steve, I did not see that coming. Wow. <laughs> Steve, you messed this one up good. I, I'm out. You are on your own. <laughs> okay, I'm 52. That hasn't happened yet. I've never been praying about anything and God was like, hey, listen, buddy, you're gonna have to run this one solo. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says he never leaves us or forsakes us. And the Bible tells us we can cast all of our cares on him because he cares for us. Not some of our cares, not just the important cares or just the big stuff. Jesus tells us, give me all of your care. I care about you. So believer, you don't have to be afraid. You, you don't have to get stressed out. You don't have to be anxious. Now listen, we can be concerned. We can care, absolutely. But we don't have to fear because the God that we serve is more than able. He is more than enough. And this is his challenge to his disciples. He said, why are you fearful? Where's your faith? And I think he would say the same thing to us today when we get all bent out of shape. Why are you fearful? Just trust him. Just put your trust in him. Verse 41 wraps up the passage. It says, and they feared exceedingly and, and, and feared meant awestruck. They were just blown away. And they said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I mean, that, that whole scene paints such an incredible picture. Disciples freaking out. Jesus is asleep. He gets up and he hollers at the wind and the wind listens. And his disciples are just jaw to the ground like, who is this guy? This is our God. This is the one who's the God of the storm. There is nothing beyond him. There is nothing greater than him. There is no power above him. There is nothing that, that Jesus bends the knee to. He is Lord over everything. And the disciples were blown away. So what, what kind of person, who is this? This is God. This is our savior. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that you can put your faith in this morning and lay 
your burden down and lay your storm down and lay down your stress and anxiety and worry and fear because this guy is in your corner. This guy is on our side. Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? What a great illustration of the power of God. So what are some lessons here with the disciples? Got a few of them. One, you could do everything right and still walk right into a storm. Don't beat yourself up. It happens. It happens to everyone. You could do everything right and still walk into a storm. Two, just because God is silent doesn't mean he's not there. It doesn't mean he doesn't care. Listen, we've prayed. We've asked God to move. We believe in miracles. And that's how I pray. God, do something incredible. And there's times when you pray it and pray it and pray it, and you don't see the results you want to see. I want you to know he's still there. He's still with you. Never leaves, never forsakes. And we got these two approaches to the storms in our life. Are we going to approach it in the flesh and respond with fear? Or are we going to approach it in the spirit and respond with faith? And every single storm in your life becomes a litmus test for how is your faith? Are you trusting in God or are you going the other way? And every storm, it shows up in our life. Maybe the smaller storms, you just, you know, like water off a duck's back. That's what Pastor Dan says about my jokes all the time. Water off a duck's back. <laughs> the smaller stuff, you just let it roll off. But the bigger stuff, maybe that gets you. It becomes the test for us. How are we responding to the hardships in our life? Are we responding with faith? There's a financial hardship. We're going to trust God. There's a, a health scare. God, we're going to trust you. We're not going to lose our minds here. We're going to trust you. Something with your spouse something with your kids, those are way harder. If it's me and affecting me, like I feel like I can take care of me. Now it's affecting them. Like, come on, God, you gotta do something for them now, right? Uh, any parent would rather go through something than see their kids go through it. Easy, no brainer. So now, God, I have to trust you, not for me. Like I got that part, I gotta trust you for them. Oh, now it got harder. Now we're at another level. How are we gonna respond? Are we gonna respond with fear? Or are we gonna trust the God who with just one word can calm every storm. And that's the reminder to us, the power of God in our storm. In every situation, he simply can speak the victory. Now, as we kind of wind this up, I'll have the worship team come and join me. There's a couple, a couple other points I need to make. So as we're wrapping up the series and we're thinking about the storms in our life and how Noah endured and followed God and still had to go through it and faith, not fear, all this stuff, there's some other stuff that, that stands out that we need to know. First one is this. So Noah gets off the boat after 371 days. And what does he see? Does he see the same world that he left? Is everything the same and just, you know, cleaner? <laughs> no. The actual landscape has been changed. I would argue the geology of the earth changed incredibly after the flood. Everything was different. He was starting over. Sometimes the storms in our life are of such a nature that when the storm finally passes, we're walking in a new reality. There, there's some different stuff that's going on now. It's not the way it was before the storm. It's not the way it was during the storm. That was terrible. But now we're through it and everything is different. There's been changes. There, there's been pieces have been moved and now we're adjusting to this new, this new phase of life. I want you to know God was with Noah before the flood, God was with Noah through every single raindrop. And when Noah took his first step onto dry ground, when everything was different, God was still with him there. 
And the same God who sustains us through the storm can help us deal with this new landscape after the storm. God was there with him. God never left him. Storms change us. Sometimes it's just an internal change. Sometimes the storm changes a lot, but God is still there. He's still with us. And then we have the other thought, the thought we don't like, but it happens a lot. What if Jesus doesn't calm the storm? That, that's how I pray. I don't know how you pray. That's how I pray. I'm praying, Jesus, calm the storm. Jesus, deliver me out of the storm. Jesus, jump up in your boat and be like, peace, be still, done. And we pray for that. But what do we do when God doesn't calm the storm? Because you know what we don't pray for? Lord, I'm okay with the storm. Just help me to get through it. <laughs> we don't pray that. <laughs> we, we pray, end it. Deliver it. God, heal. God, deliver. God, provide. Storm, end. In Jesus' name. But sometimes God lets the storm continue. And he says, I'll go with you. Sometimes we pray for deliverance and, and Jesus says, I'm not going to deliver you. I'm not going to change this, but I'm going to give you the strength to keep rowing. And we're going we're gonna to get through this storm together. I'm going to sit on your other side and I'm going to help you to get through it. I don't want you to think this morning, every time we pray, God's going to change everything. And, and I love it when he does. I've seen God answer prayer. I've seen him calm storms. I've seen God move powerfully. That's why I pray for it. But I also know there's times when he says, I'm gonna just support you through this. I'm gonna be there for you. And I've felt the presence of Jesus just as much in those seasons, maybe more so than when God does something miraculous. When God sits right next to us, he says, I'll never leave. I'll never forsake you even in your hardest time, even in this terrible storm, I'm right there with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you row. I'm gonna help you get to the other side. We, we pray for deliverance, but sometimes God just gives us the strength to keep going. In fact, there are a whole bunch of people in this room this morning who have prayed in the past for God to deliver them from a situation and he didn't, but he gave you strength and you're here today because he upheld you. Even when he doesn't do miracles, he's powerful and he, he upholds us. Hebrews chapter two, verse nine, just one more thing to think about before we close. We covered this Wednesday night. It says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Jesus suffered. Part of him completing the work that God had for him, the King James says made perfect, it means completion. Part of Jesus completing the work was suffering. And if Jesus had to suffer to complete his job, don't think that we're not gonna have suffering. In fact, your salvation began with suffering. Christ suffering on the cross. And your, continue, your, your continued growth and the, the growth of your faith will also come through suffering. It will come through difficult seasons. It will come through, through heartaches and difficulties and trials and tribulations. It began with the death of Jesus. It will be culminated when we learn to truly and fully die to ourselves and trust him and trust him completely. Trust him through the tribulation. Trust him for the preparation and then trust him at the end for the transformation that God is working in you through your troubles. Romans 8, 28, I referenced it two weeks ago. All things work together for the good of those who love him. So in your storm, God has your attention. In your storm, we run to him. 
And we don't just run to him, we run to him in faith, not in fear. And we lay hold of the promises of his word that says, God, you're doing something with this. Your work, this transformation, Lord, it's coming. We submit to you, we trust you, have your way, King Jesus. Even in the middle of a storm, Jesus, we trust you. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't put your faith in Jesus for your salvation. And that's a spiritual storm. And I want you to know this morning, his arms are open wide. Romans tells us if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart, that we will be saved. Anyone, whosoever, there's a lot of whosoever's here today. No matter your background, no matter your age, no matter what you've done, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus has opened up the door of that ark spiritually to rescue you from the storms of hell and eternity without him. And he's inviting you on board. And if you're here today and you have not placed your faith in Jesus, you have not confessed with your mouth that Jesus is my Lord and savior, you can today. And whoever you are, when you call on that name of Jesus, he welcomes us into his family. Right out of the storm and right into his care. If that's you this morning, I'm gonna encourage you to come and find a spot at this altar. Our altar team, if you guys would come and, and take your spots, there's people that would love to pray with you, to help you, to put your faith in Christ. Maybe you're here today and you're in the middle of a storm and you're praying, God, speak your peace. God, give us that peace, be still. Lord, save, Lord, heal. Lord, deliver, provide, guide us. And we serve a God who with one word can calm your storm. And if you're here today and that's your prayer, come to, he wants you to come. He tells us to come. Come to this altar this morning and cry out to your God. And maybe you're here and you've been in the storm for a, for a hot minute and you are feeling it and you are tired and maybe you brought it on yourself. Maybe it was just something that popped up on you. Either way, it's out of your control now. And you're just saying, God, I need you. I need your presence with me. I need your peace to cover me. I, I need to feel you at my side right now. If that's you this morning, God wants to meet you here. I'll pray with you this morning. And after we pray, I wanna encourage you, if God is speaking to your heart, find a spot at this altar, find one of these people to pray with you and let's go to Jesus. He's not sleeping, church. He cares. He knows what's going on. He's waiting for us to come to him. Would you stand together with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your word and I thank you that there is power in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you are greater than any storm that we face. And I pray for some in this place today that they would have a revelation of faith and they would understand this morning that our God is greater. Lord, just speak that truth over some doubting minds and some doubting hearts this morning. Our God is greater. And Lord, no matter what we face, you don't always promise it's gonna be easy, but you always promise to be with us. So Lord, your children this morning in the middle of storms, in the middle of difficult seasons, as we pray for deliverance, as we pray for your power to move, God, we pray that we would feel and sense your presence with us. Lord, that you would give us the strength that we need to keep our eyes on you. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, lead us and guide us and strengthen us as only you can do. Lord, for the, for the weary one this morning, God, fill them with your strength. God, for, for the one who is just beating themselves up, lying in the bed that they made, Lord, let them feel your love and your presence and your mercy and your forgiveness. And Lord, let the truth of your word just permeate our hearts. You never leave us. You never forsake us. God, make your presence real to your people this morning. We thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. These altars are open. Let's respond to God this morning.
Come on, we sing. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never never fail oh, we sing I trust in God my Savior the one who will never fail he will never fail I trust in God my Savior Father, we put our trust in you today. Lord, in everything we do and everything we're, we're facing right now, Lord, we put our trust in you. God, give us the strength to keep going in the midst of these storms. Father, I pray that you would also calm these storms, God. Father, give us peace. You're the God of peace. You are Jehovah Shalom, Father. We sang about it earlier. But Lord, I pray that as we, as we leave today, God, that we would always remember to trust in you, no matter the situation, wherever we might be, Lord, that we would continue to follow you and trust you wholeheartedly, God. We love you, Lord, and we praise you and we worship you, God. We love you, Lord, and your name. Amen. Church, you are dismissed. <laughs>